Hello beautiful friends, my name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Rescues and Reads. Today we are here to wrap up all of the books that I read for the month of April. If you have been with my channel for at least the past several months, you will know that I've been doing what's called a recent reads series where instead of doing a monthly wrap up, I've been coming on here and wrapping up every five books that I read. And the honest truth of it is those recent reads videos just don't get a lot of interaction. They are probably some of the lowest viewed videos on my channel. And I think that could be for a couple of reasons, but primarily I think it's because it's not necessarily a format that a lot of booktube viewers are familiar with. And I think packaging everything up in a nice monthly wrap up is probably the better way to go. Now with that being said, I admit that these videos will likely be very lengthy, but I'm okay with that because I still want to try to be as thorough as I possibly can with these reviews. I'm here to talk to you about the books that I've been reading. I'm here to tell you what I've loved, what I don't love, and possibly to give you some really great recommendations, and I want to be able to do that as thoroughly as possible. And so we're going to go ahead and go forward. I have 13 books to talk to you about today, so we're going to go ahead and jump right in, grab a snack, grab a drink, and let's do this. As most of y'all know, April 1st began Slayer Fest 23. That is the next round of my Buffy themed readathon. You have the opportunity to either participate in it for a full month from April 1st to April 30th, at which point today, April 30th would be the very last day. Or if you want to participate longer and try to read more prompts, I am actually doing a quarter long version that's running from April 1st to June 30th. And that is what I am participating in. And so as I'm going through this wrap up and talking about some of the books that I read, if they did satisfy Slayer Fest prompts, I will do my best to remember to tell you what those were. Because quite honestly, a lot of the books that I read for April were specifically for Slayer Fest. So this is almost kind of going to be like a Slayer Fest month one wrap up, if you will. So the very first book that I finished in the month of April was a middle grade novel called Out of the Dust by Karen Hesse. This, like I said, is a middle grade novel that is written entirely in verse. And I know that is a completely random book to see here on my channel. And it is not one that I normally ever would have picked up in my life, but I picked it up for a handful of reasons. First, in order to satisfy another reading challenge, I had to read a Newbery Award medal winner. And this is one. I also had to read a book of poetry and a book written in verse. And so this kind of satisfied all of those challenges in one, but also it is a short or quick read. And this satisfied the basic bitch vampire prompt for Slayer Fest to read a short or quick read. So it really ended up satisfying like four separate things for me. And so I could not pass the opportunity to go ahead and read this book. This is actually following a 14 year old girl during the Dust Bowl period. I believe she's either in Oklahoma or Texas. I don't remember which, but it is about the struggles of her and her family during this time. I think this was only two hours total on audio. So I was able to get through it in an hour of listening time. I feel a bit unusual actually giving this a rating just because it is a book that is so outside of my comfort zone. It is never in a million years something that I would have read on my own because first of all, not only am I not a middle grade reader, but I do not like poetry. I do not like books written in verse. I never have. I don't own any poetry. I don't want to read any poetry and I don't really connect to novels written in verse. So I feel a bit unusual about giving this a star rating just because it went in at such a disadvantage when I was reading it. But ultimately I didn't hate my reading experience of this. I gave it a three stars. It's not anything that's ever going to really stick with me, but I did feel that in this short little novel, the author managed to appropriately display the harrowing nature of the Dust Bowl. If you have any knowledge or experience with the Dust Bowl period, you know what a trying time that was. And I feel like this is such a great introduction to that topic for younger middle grade readers. I think it really did a great job of depicting just the desolation and the desperation, the hopelessness of that time. And so because of that, I ended up like enjoying this a lot more than I thought I would. So I did give it a three stars. Like I said, nothing that's really going to stick with me, but it wasn't a horrible reading experience. The next book that I read was Crest. This is the third book in the Lunar Chronicles series by Marissa Meyer. I used this book to satisfy the prompt of Buffy to read a book featuring a badass female character. As y'all know, a big goal of mine for 2023 is to make progress in or complete as many series as possible. And because of that, a lot of the books that I've challenged myself to read in 2023 are sequels and Cress is definitely one of them. And so when I had the opportunity to fit it into Slayer Fest, I decided to go ahead and go forward. I can't really talk too much about Cress specifically because it is the third book in a series. It's a quartet. This is essentially a young adult sci-fi series of retellings. Cinder, of course, was a Cinderella retelling. Scarlet was a Little Red Riding Hood retelling. Press is a Rapunzel retelling. And then Winter, I believe, is a Snow White retelling. In the very first book, you are meeting Cinder. This is taking place in New Beijing. So it's definitely a futuristic time period. Cinder herself is a cyborg and she is a gifted mechanic, but she doesn't necessarily have an easy life because she is living with her stepmother and stepsisters. Her stepmother doesn't like her at all. And currently in this world, a devastating plague is ravaging the population. And one of her sisters is actually sick and Cinder is kind of being blamed 
blamed for her stepsister's illness. And she ends up kind of being sent off as a test subject as they're trying to find a cure for this plague. And so she is being treated, I think it's at the palace of the emperor of New Beijing. And during her time at this palace, her life becomes intertwined with Prince Kai, who is the son of the emperor. And it kind of goes from there, especially as she uncovers some pretty serious secrets about herself. And there is like an intergalactic struggle that's going on. There's some politics at play as well. In this world, the moon is a habited colony and the queen of the moon is basically not a very nice person and some stuff is going down. And so you're following Cinder as she's uncovering secrets about herself that are going to impact the fate of their world. And then it just kind of goes from there. I really enjoyed my time with Cinder and Scarlet and a couple of years had passed between when I had read Scarlet and when I decided to pick up Crest. And so I had lost a lot of momentum with this series, but I'm so glad that I ended up picking this up because Crest so far is definitely my favorite of the series. More and more things are starting to happen. And so I think winter is definitely going to be like the most action packed of all of the stories because we are definitely getting down into the nitty gritty when all of the things are being revealed, everybody is coming together, the truth is finally coming out. And now it's kind of up to Cinder and Scarlet and Crest to save the world. So this was a very strong reading experience for me. I gave it a four stars and I'm very excited to continue. I might eventually get to winter later this year to finish up the series. Then the next book I picked up in April was Spells for Forgetting by Adrienne Young. This was a selection for the Bookworm Bitches Book Club. It is a book club that I now help moderate on Goodreads. I'll try to remember to leave the link down below for you, but I needed to get to this anyway because I wanted to use this to satisfy the Slayer Fest prompt of Willow to read a witchy read because that is definitely what this is. This is a very witchy atmospheric story that is set on the island of Sertia in the Pacific Northwest. It is an island that is deeply rooted in ancestral magic. All of the women on this island have some form of this ancestral magic running through them and the island itself is somewhat sentient. And so that's kind of how this story begins with our main character Emery Blackwood. She has lived on Sertia her whole entire life and she kind of can sense something is coming because the trees on this island have changed color overnight and these little starling birds which typically leave the island at the very beginning of the first signs of winter have stayed and it's kind of like an ominous sign of things to come and wouldn't you know on this same exact day this is the day that August Salt returns to the island after 14 years. August has been away from the island for 14 years because 14 years ago tragedy struck the island. Billy Morgan who was Emery's best friend was murdered and August Salt was kind of fingered for the crime and this also happened at the same day that the island's orchard which is basically its main source of commerce like tourists come from the mainland to this island to pick apples and things like that and then they end up going to the shops and the restaurants and whatnot so the orchard is really the main source of income for this island and on the same day that Lily Morgan was murdered the orchard caught fire as well and so this was a deeply devastating time for the island and August is returning not because he wants to he knows that he is not welcome on the island he never planned on setting foot on Sertia again however his mother has recently passed away and it was her dying wish that she go back to Sertia and be buried and so August is returning and also he hopes to kind of close some old wounds because he and Emery were deeply in love as teenagers. They were in a relationship. They had plans on running away together and leaving Sersha for good and finally getting away from the island. But of course, all of this stuff went down and he basically had to up and abandon her and he didn't even tell her goodbye. And of course, Emery has reasons for not wanting to see August. These are wounds that have never really closed for her. His departure kind of derailed her whole entire life. She, like I said, she had plans on leaving Sersha and now she has been on this island still for the past 14 years running her family's, I think it's like a tea leaf kind of shop. And so he is back and she is very hesitant about seeing him again. But it soon becomes apparent that there are other reasons for wanting August Salt off the island. A lot of people are not happy to see him return, but it's more than just the obvious reasons of Lily's murder that they are not wanting him to be on the island. And Emery's determined to find out what is going on, what secrets are being kept. And so she ends up discovering some deep betrayals, some closely guarded secrets by those she's known her entire life, by people that she trusted that she grew up with. Once all of these secrets are revealed, she's going to have to kind of figure out what to do with that. Does she stay? Does she go? Does she trust August? What is happening with this? And I enjoyed this one immensely. I believe that this was Adrienne Young's first attempt at an adult novel. And I think that she did a brilliant job, especially with the atmosphere. While I was reading this, I absolutely got like Summer of Salt vibes or The Wicked Deep vibes by Shay Earnshaw only in adult form. The atmosphere was almost a character. The island certainly was a character because I believe I mentioned it in the beginning. The island kind of has its own sentience. It is an island that has deeply rooted ancestral magic. And so it can sense everything that is happening here. People who reside on this island, they take care of their own. They have been there for many, many generations. The island is basically in their blood. And it's kind of said like once you leave the island calls you home. And so while there was definitely a hint of magic in here at its core, this was definitely a mystery and a second chance love story. That is what I would definitely say that this was more than anything else. So this was magical realism, but more a mystery second chance love story. And of course, mingled with family drama and the complications of growing up in a small town where everybody knows everybody, especially when that town is hiding some deeply guarded secrets. So overall, I just really enjoyed my reading experience of Spells for Forgetting by Adrienne Young. I will absolutely be keeping my eye out for more adult releases by her because I thought that this was fantastic and 
I highly recommend picking it up, especially if you have read Adrienne Young's young adult novels. I think that you would enjoy this one as well, for sure. Next, to satisfy the prompt of Kathy Newman to read a book that is outside of my comfort zone, I picked up When Breath Becomes Air by Paul Kalanithi. This is a very short memoir written by Paul himself. Paul was a neurosurgeon. He was a brilliant doctor who ended up being diagnosed with terminal cancer. And he used the last several months of his life in order to kind of document his experiences, what it was like during his life as he kind of aimed for becoming a neurosurgeon, and then what ultimately happened when he got diagnosed with cancer, and then his experiences afterwards. So I honestly don't have too terribly much to say about When Breath Becomes Air. This was a very short memoir. It didn't take me long to finish it at all. And the reason that I had it satisfy the Kathy Newman prompts because nonfiction, particularly memoirs in general, are definitely outside of my comfort zone. I don't prefer to read memoirs that are written by people that I have no investment in whatsoever. And that was the case with Paul Kalanithi. The reason why I had this book on my TBR was because I had heard such amazing things about it. And I loved the idea of a book covering grief from the person who had not yet died. This is a doctor who is used to being on the other side of the doctor patient relationship. And he is now finding himself coming face to face with his own mortality. And so he definitely has a unique perspective on this because he's usually the one that's giving these diagnoses. So he knows exactly what's in store for him with this illness as he tries to fight it and what he knows is going to happen if he can no longer fight. And I thought that would be a very heartbreaking, touching, poignant perspective to read from. And it was. This is another one that I kind of feel unusual rating just because I feel like I'm rating his story when that's not the case. I'm more rating my emotional connection to the story, which I didn't really have. Like I said, it was definitely poignant, but it was also very existential as you might expect. It was very philosophical in a lot of points. I didn't necessarily feel any deep emotional connection to the story, but I felt like it was a relatable story. In America, we definitely have a culture that shies away from death. We don't like talking about death. We don't like thinking about death. And so reading the memoir of a person who is actively dying, I think that's very upfront and in your face. Like, hey, this happens. We're all going to go through it. People die. People get sick. And here's what that looks like. But also somebody who can cognitively tell you his thoughts on the process of being sick and dying and also reflecting on his life and making you reflect on your life. And I think that's one of the most poignant things about this story is that it really does make you reflect on your own life as it's meant to do. I would say the most heart-wrenching part of the story was actually the epilogue that was written by his wife. Is this something that's really going to stick with me? No, I can't say that it will. I've already forgotten the majority of what I read just because like nonfiction tends to be that way. No matter how well it's written, no matter how beautifully, ultimately a lot of the factual details just kind of slip my mind. Am I mad that I read it? No, this was a book that was on my TBR. It was something that I had already had on my radar to read and so I'm glad that I was able to go ahead and get it off my TBR. I ultimately gave this a three stars because like I said, there wasn't really an emotional connection for me. It's not something I'm going to remember weeks, months, years down the road, but I am glad that I read it. And again, not only did this satisfy the prompt of reading Kathy Newman, it was a personal challenge that I had pulled for myself in the month of April. So that also satisfied that as well. Another challenge that I pulled for April, and it was this was the next book that I read, was The Silent Sister by Diane Chamberlain. I was able to fit this into Slayer Fest as well for the prompt of Dawn to read a book that focused heavily around siblings and sibling relationships. Now, I don't want to say too terribly much about this story overall, because I feel like anything that I could say will definitely be a spoiler, especially since in the present day perspective, you are finding things out as the main character is finding things out. And I don't want to risk giving anything away. What I will say is that this follows our main character, Riley McPherson, and her father has recently passed away. She's having to go back to the town in which she was raised in order to settle his estate. She's definitely encountering a lot of obstacles while doing this, particularly from her brother, Danny. Danny is her older brother who will not help her in any way. He's definitely a very difficult person. He has some PTSD from his time in the military, and he doesn't really want to have anything to do with settling his dad's estate. He has some very negative emotions about their family, particularly as it relates to the suicide death of their older sister, Lisa. Lisa committed suicide when she was just 17 years old and Riley was only two at the time. So she doesn't remember anything, but Danny does. And he kind of remembers that Lisa was the light of their family's life. She was this very talented violin prodigy and she was going places and she was like the center of that family. And so he just kind of remembers being in the shadows growing up. So he has a lot of resentment about their father and their mother who actually passed several years prior to the start of the story. So he is not giving Riley any help whatsoever. But as Riley starts to settle this estate, it doesn't take long for some weird things to start happening. Weird things that she's starting to uncover about her sister's suicide like 23 years prior to the start of the story. She's also starting to realize that her family might not be who she thinks they are. So you're getting the perspective of Riley in the present and then you're also getting a past perspective as well. Like I said, I don't want to say anything more about that, but I will say that I found this to be a truly compulsively readable story. I wanted to keep turning the pages. I had to know what happened next. Was I able to predict some of the bigger plot twists? Yes. I feel as though there were enough clues that you as the reader are able to kind of put together the pieces of that puzzle, which also is a hallmark of a really great writer in my opinion. Like they don't want the surprise to be too out of left field. They want it to shock you, but yet still give you enough context clues that you might've been able to figure it out on your own. And I 
feel like Diane Chamberlain did a really great job of that. But figuring out these twists did not take away from my enjoyment because overall I just thought that this was solidly written, well paced, very engaging. I enjoyed myself from start to finish in this story. I would say that my only true criticism was that for the length of it and the amount of secrets and lies that were uncovered there didn't seem to be a comparable amount of redemption and resolution. The ending just kind of seems to tie everything nicely in a bow and it seems to come about way easier than I would have expected it to come about. But I still like I said very very much enjoyed my reading experience of this. This was a solid four stars and it just further cements Diane Chamberlain as like an auto by author for me because I have really liked everything that I've read from her thus far. And then for the Slayer Fest prompt of Veruca to read a second chance romance I decided to pick up Eleanor and Gray by Brittany C. Cherry. The reason I chose this one is because I needed to read this story to satisfy another challenge of reading a book by an author with the same first name as you and this definitely fit the bill. So as the title suggests this follows our main characters Eleanor and Gray and this story is kind of told in a part one and a part two. In part one you're following Eleanor and Gray as they are meeting as teenagers. Eleanor is definitely a very introverted book nerd type of person. All she wants in life is just to be alone with her books especially at the very beginning of the story. It is set at the time when the fifth Harry Potter book has been released and she's been anxiously awaiting it and that's all she wants to do is curl up in bed with Harry Potter in the Order of the Phoenix. But her best friend slash cousin is a very outgoing gregarious type of person and she wants to go to a party and she drags Eleanor. And so Eleanor is just kind of sitting in a corner minding her own business reading Harry Potter in the Order of the Phoenix and suddenly one of the more popular guys in school Grey starts to talk to her. And this ends up kind of creating a very strong friendship between Eleanor and Grey. They start hanging out a couple of times a week and going from there because they are both dealing with serious things in their personal life. Eleanor's mom has cancer and Grey is dealing with a very tumultuous home life as well. They kind of help get each other out of their houses and forget about the dark things that are going on in their lives. And so they build this extremely strong, beautiful friendship out of that. And it's starting to develop into something more. You can see it headed into a romantic direction, but as it becomes obvious that Eleanor's mom is not going to get better, she requests that she spend the last weeks of her life near the beach. And so they end up moving to Florida. And during this time, Eleanor and Gray keep in touch. They see each other every now and then, but their relationship is never quite the same as it used to be. And then all of a sudden they're going off to college. They're definitely separate, staying apart. And they just ultimately just drift apart. There's nothing really sinister about it. And then part two of the story is set, I want to say it's set about 16 years in the future. So they haven't really seen each other in 16 years. And Eleanor is currently applying for a nanny position. And she has no idea at first that the children that she's applying to nanny for are actually Grace children. It's a very sad situation in that they were all in a very terrible car accident and it claimed the life of Gray's wife and the mother of his children. So Eleanor becomes the nanny for these children, but she notices that Gray is a completely different human being than he was. He's not the open, honest, genuine, warm, loving soul that she knew. He is very dark and closed off and he is still extremely within his grief. Like he misses his wife. This is not one of those situations where, you know, he and his wife were having problems and were on the verge of the divorce and then she died or he and his wife were never meant to be, but they ended up getting pregnant when they were very young and they ultimately tied the knot and things like that. No. He and his wife were in love. They had a beautiful family, a beautiful life, and Gray is still very much grieving his loss. He doesn't know how to deal with it and he definitely doesn't know how to interact with his children now that their mother is gone. And so he has kind of thrown himself into work. That's all he does all day is work, work, work. He spends barely any time with his children. And you kind of watch Eleanor as she goes in and she develops a relationship with his children and then ultimately through that relationship and helping them to get through their grief, she starts to help him as well. And I just thought that this was wonderfully honest and raw at a lot of points throughout the story. I also like just how healthy and self-aware and realistic these two main characters were about what they wanted and what they needed. And they always showed up for each other during the hard times. And I thought that was just extremely beautiful. So this is ultimately a story about two broken people who help each other deal during different times of their life, during the worst times of their life. This was my very first book by Brittany C. Cherry. And I was just really impressed by her writing style, the banter that was in here, the heart and the warmth that she put into this story, as well as the humor and the love. So I just love the overall portrayal of grief, forgiveness, moving forward. I loved how beautiful Eleanor was as a person and how wonderful Gray was as a man and a father. This was just a very beautiful story. I really enjoyed it a lot. I gave it a 4.5 out of 5 on Goodreads, but like thinking back on it, I think it's probably closer to a 4, like not quite as high, but like the emotions were there, y'all. The emotions were there when I finished reading this story. So this was such a solid read and I'm glad that I read it. All right, and then immediately after finishing Eleanor and Gray, I jumped right into another book that dealt with grief, Heat of My Heart by Leah Lewis. So this satisfied the Slayer Fest prompt of Jenny to read a book dealing heavily with grief. It also satisfied the prompt of Sweets to read a book that is either written in verse or focuses heavily on music and this definitely does. So this follows our main character Natalie and about two and a half years prior to the start of the story she lost her husband her soulmate in a tragic accident. They had been together for 
about 10 years. They had this beautiful life that they loved. They were still very much in love and happy in their marriage. And then he was tragically taken from her. And at this point, like I said, two and a half years later, her friends are all very worried about her because they think that she should be at least trying to move on at this point. And she's not. Natalie's still very much in her grief and she really has no interest in moving on. She's basically just existing at this point. She's not really living. You know, she goes to work, she does her thing. And then she comes back to this cottage that they bought together that they were planning on renovating that she doesn't really love anymore because he is not here. So she's in a house that she doesn't even really want or love anymore. But she just goes home and she stays there and she basically hides away from everybody and everything. She is basically empty. She has lost a lot of motivation for life, for friends, for anything else really. One of the only things that kind of brings her joy these days is that a couple of times a week when she's going through a London train station, she stops and she plays at the piano in the middle of the train station. It's very much therapy for her because that's what she did for a living. She used to be a piano teacher and her and her best friend at one point were writing a musical which kind of got trashed at some point when her friend kind of betrayed her in a way and so she's also dealing with the loss of a longtime friendship. So Natalie is going through a lot but she finds a lot of healing and solace by playing at this piano and one day she's going to play at the piano and she finds some sheet music but not only is this just sheet music but it's music that is actually personal to her and personal to her husband and one of the next days she goes and there's another one that's again personal to her and her husband and she starts to really look forward to the sheet music. It kind of gives her hope. It brings a spark back into her life and it kind of goes from there as she's trying to figure out who is leaving the sheet music for her but it also kind of follows her own journey into newfound love with somebody unexpected and I overall just really enjoyed the journey of the story. I don't want to say too much about this. Let's just say that some new people come into Natalie's life. People that end up meaning so much to her and help her in her healing process and this was another beautiful story about grief. I love stories that explore grief because it's such a universal experience. We might all deal with grief differently but we all deal with grief at some point in our life and I think it's something that can really connect us if we let it. But I do also think that people can be very very selfish in their grief. I'm actually currently reading a story about that right now and I'm going to get to that at the very end because it's going to be the final book that I wrap up. But I think people can be very lost and selfish in their grief and during that time they push everybody away and they can't see the bigger picture and they can't see the future. They're basically so focused on right now and just like getting day to day. And so I was really glad to see that Natalie ultimately ended up finding the hope and finding the will and the motivation to go out and live a life that she loved again because she had really lost that after the death of her husband. I do have Eight Perfect Hours by Leah Lewis that I might try to get to later this year like during the holiday season because it's a snowy wintry kind of read. So this was phenomenal and I'm glad that I decided to pick it up and if you are looking for a sweet heartwarming touching story that also deals on some heavier hitting topics this is a good one to try out. Next I ended up reading The King of Crows by Libba Bray. This was the third challenge that I ended up pulling for myself in the month of April so I was glad to be able to read it. This also finishes a series for me because this is the fourth and final book in the Diviner series so it was definitely a book already on my radar to read in 2023. I obviously can't say too terribly much about this story because like I said it is the fourth and final book in a series but if you're not familiar the Diviner series is a young adult series that is set in the roaring 1920s in Manhattan New York and it follows a group of teenagers who have extraordinary abilities they are called diviners in the very first book you're just introduced to the individual characters you're learning who they are and what they can do and they don't really understand what they can do or why I didn't love the first book but I'm glad that I continued because in books two three and four you really find out a lot more about their powers, why they have them, what ended up happening. And there's also this malevolent power called the King of Crows. And he is trying to kill the diviners. He is trying to take them out. And he's ultimately trying to come into the real world and take over the real world. I really enjoyed the later books because you're getting so many more answers. In these later books, they all start to connect and they start to understand themselves better and why they have these powers and what they have to do with them. Like what it means to have these powers and what they're going to have to do in order to kind of save the world. It becomes on them to save the world. And I ultimately ended up really enjoying the King of Crows. I don't think it was my favorite. I still think books two and three are my favorite in this series so far. I understand why the King of Crows gets a lot of negative reviews because I will say that in this story the diviners are kind of separated for the majority of the story and I feel like the story meandered quite a bit. Like it picks up immediately after the end of book three and something big happened at the end of book three. There's a lot of chaos. There's a lot of things going on and then all of a sudden the momentum just kind of slows down. But I didn't mind it overall and I just thought the reading experience was fairly strong. So I did didn't mind the fourth book. I thought it ended up being quite a solid ending to the series and I'm glad that I have another series down. So this was a four stars for me. This also satisfied the Slayer Fest prompt of Wesley to read a YA novel. Then I read yet another sequel and at the time I picked it up I thought that this was concluding a trilogy but it turns out it's not. There's going to be at least one more book. So at least I am caught up in the series. It is the Unsub series by Meg Gardner and I read The Dark Corners of the Night. I read this to satisfy the Slayer Fest prompt of Zach Kralik to read a mystery thriller or true crime book that features a serial killer in some capacity. This is a series that follows Caitlin Hendricks in the very first book. She is a detective in California and then by book 
two, she is actually a member of the FBI's behavioral analysis unit. So the books kind of become like an episode of Criminal Minds. And that's really what the dark corners of the night is. You're following a man who's breaking into families' homes in the middle of the night. He is brutally killing a mom and dad and kind of torturing the kids, not like physically torturing them. He doesn't hurt them, but he's scaring them. He's leaving messages for them. He's drawing on them and things like that. He's definitely using them to leave a message for the wider world. And so Caitlin and her team are being called out to California to help solve these heinous crimes that are now involving children. And I personally have some mixed feelings about this that really don't have a lot to do with the book itself. I used to be a huge fan of detection fiction. That used to be one of my favorite things to read. It's what I grew up on and it's something that followed me well into my adult life. But something that I've definitely noticed in the recent years is that while I still love the investigative aspects of detective fiction because that's always what I really enjoyed in those stories. But what I don't get in these detective fictions are the emotional connections to the characters because it's very much about solving the crime and it's not about the detectives themselves. It's not about their personal lives or their relationships with other people or things like that. You might get that some. That's not really what the story is about, but that's what I really need in order to truly connect to the story. I need those complex character dynamics. I say this a million times, but in order for me to like emotionally connect, I need those strong character driven elements of the story. And so my interest in detective fiction has definitely waned over the past couple of years, but I still find that Meg Gardner is such a solid writer of the investigative aspects of these stories, especially now that she's introduced the behavioral analysis unit, because now it's diving further deeply into the psychological aspects of the killers. It's no longer just about the physical aspects of the crime and finding physical forensic evidence. It's also about criminal profiling. It's about trying to figure out who this killer is just based on their actions and how they are committing their crimes. And I've just always been incredibly fascinated by that. And Meg Gardner is so talented about including those aspects in the story. I will say that because of that, there was definitely a dryness to this, a detachment to it. I thought when I first started the story, I was going to have to DNF it just because that's no longer what I'm looking for. It's no longer what I'm interested in. Even though I think Meg Gardner is a very talented author and I really enjoy her ability to write very detailed and clever crime novels. That's not what I'm looking for anymore. Luckily, the story really did pick up and the last two or three hours of the audiobook, it was so high stakes. It was very intense. It was fast paced. It was really about pursuing the killer once they knew who he was. And I was just like on the edge of my seat needing to know what happened. And I thought that that was very well done as well. But ultimately, this pulled itself up. I think I will go ahead and continue in the series, especially if there's only one more left because I want to see what the resolution is because it's a continuation of what happened from book one. So I think I'm interested enough to continue, but I don't think I'm going to actively pursue detective fiction going forward. So I rated this a 3.5 out of 5. The last two to three hours was a four, but like the first half of the story was like a three. So I'm splitting the difference and giving it a 3.5. So still strong overall. I still remember a lot of the details of the story and I will continue, but just not my thing anymore. And for the prompt of Cordelia to read a beautiful book or a cover by, I decided to pick up Kingdom of the Cursed by Carrie Maniscalco. I have this beautifully stunning fairy loot edition and I just love it so much. This is another sequel to another series. So I'm definitely making progress in a lot of these series. This is set in 19th century Italy and it follows our main character, Amelia. And she and her twin sister are what are called Strehi, I believe is how you pronounce that, but they are essentially witches and they are living among humans, like I said, in 19th century Italy. And one night, Amelia's twin, Vittoria, misses dinner and she's very concerned. So she goes after her and she ends up discovering her twin sister's dead body. And the story kind of takes off from there as Amelia is determined to get revenge for her sister. She wants to figure out who killed her sister and it ends up kind of taking her on a journey. She finds out a lot of secrets that her sister has been holding, including her involvement in dark magic. And she kind of uses some of the information she finds on Vittoria and dark magic to summon some help. And that help comes in the form of Prince Rath, who is one of the princes of hell. But Prince Rath, of course, has his own agenda. He has other things going on. He has other reasons for helping Amelia. And so this is the ups and downs of their investigation. And it ultimately ends on somewhat of a little cliffhanger that continues in Kingdom of the Curse. So I'm not going to go too terribly much into Kingdom of the Curse. I ultimately gave this story a four stars, but I will say that in my opinion, not much happened in this story until probably the last like, I don't know, one or two hours of the audiobook. What this really felt like to me was a back and forth, will they, won't they, between Wrath and Amelia. There were probably four or five different scenes where Amelia and Wrath start to get like hot and heavy and then something thwarts their intentions, whether it's them doing it or some outside force, but it was really repetitive and redundant in that way. And there was just a lot of that, a lot of back and forth, will they, won't they, things of that nature. Towards the end of the story, there is a lot that was revealed. There is a twist that made things just a lot more interesting and it becomes a little bit more high stakes. But part of me also wonders if this really needed to be a trilogy, if it could possibly have been a duology. Now, of course, I haven't read the third and final book, which is Kingdom of the Fear. There could be a lot that takes place in that story that definitely could not have been meshed with this one. But I ultimately just feel like this was way too long for what it actually was. Sure, there were little things sprinkled here and there, clues 
clues, answers, mysteries that keep the story going. But just really what foreshadowed everything was her relationship with Prince Rath, but also her non-relationship with Prince Rath. Like, are they together? Are they not? Does she want to be with him? Does she not? Does he want to be with her? Like, what is going on with him? He's being broody. He's being elusive. He doesn't want to continue with this. Like, what are the secrets that he's keeping? Because that's really what this is about too. He's still keeping a lot of secrets from her. And I ultimately gave it a four stars just because of the latter part of the book. Like, I started to really get into it, invested, and I wanted to know what happened. So I'm definitely intrigued to continue. I do have Kingdom of the Feared, again, in the Beautiful Fairy Loot Edition. So I will absolutely be continuing, possibly trying to finish it by the end of the year. I don't know. Still felt like this was a solid reading experience. It just wasn't quite what I wanted. It wasn't quite as eventful as I would have hoped it would be. But overall, still enjoyed this. Then a random story that I ended up finishing in April was Hyperbole in Half by Ellie Brosh. This did not satisfy any Slayer Fest attempts. This satisfied some other challenges that I was pursuing and I just decided to go ahead and pick it up because I knew I was going to need it to read it physically because it's told almost entirely like in these comic script type formats. So this is more reminiscent of like a collection of short stories on Ellie Brosh's life than it is an actual memoir because each of these is like a different section with different stories that is being told in here. This is a very popular nonfiction story that's gotten a lot of buzz since it was published about 10 years ago at this point because even though this is definitely lighthearted, it is very comedic, it is very funny. I was laughing out loud crying at certain points in this story but this is also a depiction of mental illness because Ellie Brosh I believe suffers from depression and definitely also anxiety and that also goes into a lot of the stories that she's telling and how her brain works and how she interprets situations and the funny things that have happened to her and how she's dealt with it and things like that. So like I said very humorous, very lighthearted, had me laughing a lot but there were also some serious undertones in here as well to mental illness. I I have talked to a couple of people who said that this was one of the first books that they read that really fully discussed what it's like to have these mental illnesses and that they really related and appreciated Ali Brosh's approach to it in here and I can see why that that's very important. This just was a fun quick read for me. Her experiences with her two dogs are phenomenal and there was a story about a goose in here. Yes a goose that just like I was dying. I was crying laughing so hard. So Ali Brosh has a phenomenal talent for telling these stories. She does so in this remarkably funny way. I love her humor so much. I have no personal experience with Ali Brosh outside of this book. I've never read her blog which is ultimately how she got started and what influenced this book and things like that. So I have no experience with her. I don't know anything about her outside of this story but I do know that this was a really good time and it's a great depiction of mental illness as well. So I highly recommend if you have not already picked it up and I'm glad that I read it and it's super super short. It's 360 pages but like you can feasibly get through this in like three total hours because it's very very easy to consume and read and lots of pictures and things like that. So this is another random one that I picked up but I'm glad that I did another reading challenge satisfied and off my list. Then to satisfy the Slayer Fest prompt of Der Kindestad to read a book that is meant for children like a middle grade or a book centered around children, I decided to read Before We Were Yours by Lisa Wingate. Lisa Wingate is one of the authors that I wanted to read in 2023 because I've heard literally nothing but great things about Before We Were Yours. I ended up loving the story so much. It was beautifully told, well written, solid storytelling, and I ended up just falling in love with these characters and wanting the best for them overall. So this is told in two perspectives. The first perspective is set in Memphis, Tennessee in 1939. You're following 12 year old Real Foss. She is the oldest of five siblings so she is kind of the de facto parent sometimes when her parents are unavailable and at the very beginning of the story her mother is currently having a very hard labor with twins. She is in danger of losing her life and so Real's father takes their mother to a hospital leaving Real in charge of her siblings. But that night a group of strangers come and take them away. They live on a shanty boat in the Mississippi River so they're definitely not well off by any means. They are on the poorer side they are called the river rats but they are from a very loving home so even though they are not wealthy like they are still well taken care of their parents love them very much but like I said that night after their parents go to the hospital the five children are basically taken from their shanty boat and they are put into the Tennessee Children's Home Society and they are basically lied to this entire time they are told that they are going to see their parents that their parents are going to come to get them they are being lied to because what ended up happening is their parents were tricked into signing over custody rights to the state of Tennessee and the Tennessee Children's Home. This is actually based on the real life story of Georgia Tan who had a black market baby brokering business where she was taking children, literally stealing children away from their parents and selling them to wealthier, more prestigious people who could not have children of their own. Well, some of these children were placed as wards into like the Tennessee foster care system. So some of these children legitimately no longer had a home. A lot of these children were like stolen right off the street. They could have just been walking around and they would be stolen off the street. Or as in the case of Real Foss and her siblings, her parents were tricked basically into signing away their rights to these children. And in between the time when children were 
were taken away and placed into the Tennessee Children's Home Societies and then placed with other families. They were treated horrifically. They were not kept in great conditions. They were often degraded and physically abused. It's estimated that 500 children ended up dying while in Georgia Tan's Tennessee Children's Home, not to mention the thousands of children that actually were adopted out into better homes and how they were taken away from their families. And those people might not even know that this ever happened. And so Real Fossa's story is meant to be based on realistic experiences of people that this happened to. So you're following Real Foss as her and her four siblings are taken into the Tennessee Children's Home where they're not treated well at all and where she's being separated from her siblings as hard as she's trying to keep them together. They're being taken away from her and placed into other families. In the present day perspective, you are following 30 year old Avery Stafford and she had built a successful career in the DC area as a federal prosecutor, but she has returned to her hometown of Aiken, South Carolina to help her father. Her father is a congressman and he is having some ill health. And so she has returned home to help take care of him and also to help prepare for the fact that she might eventually have to try to maybe take his Congress seat. And one day they're at a publicity event at a nursing home. There's a bunch of nursing home scandals going on during this time. And they are at a nursing home and one of the elderly ladies there kind of mistakes Avery for somebody else. And for some reason, this experience is very chilling to Avery. She doesn't know why. But after this publicity event, she is called by the nursing home and told that this older lady has taken Avery's bracelet. And so Avery goes back to the nursing home and she starts to talk to this older woman. And she comes to realize that May knows her grandmother, Judy. Judy is currently in another nursing home. She is suffering from dementia, so she is quickly losing her mind. And Avery realizes that there is a bigger connection between May and Judy that she doesn't understand. And so it sets her on a quest to understand exactly who May is to her grandmother, but exactly who was her grandmother. What is going on in her grandmother's past? She starts to uncover this because she's afraid that if secrets in the closet come out, that this could hinder her family's political career. But she starts to uncover some pretty serious things about what her grandmother and May went through. And so she starts to uncover a lot of answers, a lot of secrets that she didn't even know existed. And not only was this book poignant, but it was harrowing at points when you think about what these poor children went through. And so, so many children, like I said, hundreds and thousands of children were taken from their families and placed in other families. But in the meantime, they were also subjected to awful situations. Can you even just imagine the trauma of having to experience that? And then in the case of real thoughts in the situation, she is having to watch her brothers and sisters being taken and sold into other families while she is left behind. She couldn't keep them together. She doesn't know where they're going, what is happening. She wants to see her family again. She misses her mom and her dad. It is an atrocity that we cannot even fathom. And worst of all, like Georgia Tan didn't even get to pay for her sins. In 1950, she ended up passing away like shortly after all of this stuff started to rain down on her. She passed away of, I believe it was cancer. She got sick, she died. She didn't have to pay for the sins or the aftermath because as you can imagine, the aftermath of this is still happening. It's just really interesting to think of the ripple effect that this woman caused with her black market baby business. And it's something that's not often talked about. It's not often told. I never really really known anything about this before reading this story and now I'm definitely interested in learning more. So I think Lisa Wingate just did a phenomenal job of bringing to life the Foss family and trying to represent the actual victims of this atrocity. I truly enjoyed this as much as you can enjoy a story like this and I look forward to reading more from Lisa Wingate in the future. All right y'all and then the final book that I want to talk to you about today is one that I'm currently reading. I'm going to be finishing it today and that's why I just want to talk to you about it here. I am currently reading Fly Away by Kristen Hanna. This is satisfying the Xander prompt of Slayer Fest to read a book from one of your favorite authors or to reread a favorite. And so I chose this because this also will finish a series. It is the Firefly Lane duology. Firefly Lane is ultimately a story of friendship. It follows Tully and Kate and their three decade friendship from the 1970s when they met at 14 years old to the early 2000s, which is when Firefly Lane takes place. And of course, you're following the ups and downs, the trials and tribulations that come along with a 30 year friendship. Tully and her ambition and career to be a journalist and Kate as she falls in love and she has children and all of the stuff that happens in between. It is definitely my favorite type of story, a very character driven narrative. And if you've read Firefly Lane, you'll know that that story had a very sad ending. It really did, but it was also a finished ending, I feel. So does Fly Away need to exist? No. However, it is also giving us the opportunity to follow these characters that we got to know so well in Firefly Lane. It's giving us an opportunity to follow them in the aftermath of what happened in Firefly Lane. Now, I will say that this is an indication of what happens when people become so self-absorbed in their grief that they forget about everybody else in their life, that they push those people away. But not only that, but they stop being able to see the future and the big picture. They have lost almost all hope, motivation. And not only do they suffer in silence, but they suffer endlessly. Like they're not willing to get past it. They're not willing to get help. They're not willing to see that there could be more to life. They are just so lost in the grief that they're experiencing. I don't really want to say more about what that grief is, obviously, for Fly Away, because this happens in Firefly Lane. But there is definitely a big loss that happens in this book. And so Fly Away is a continuation of that. So the story in Fly Away 
Way is set in 2010, about four years after the events of Firefly Lane. So you're seeing events in the present, but it's also leading to flashbacks of what happened in the immediate aftermath and the years leading up to 2010. So you're definitely getting the whole story of what happened immediately after 2006 and, and what is currently going on in 2010. And I'm having mixed emotions about what I'm reading right now, because as always, this is definitely signature Kristen Hanna. There's a lot of complicated character relationships, dynamic characters. She is bringing these characters to life. You feel like you know them, especially if you've watched the adaptation on Netflix. The adaptation of Firefly Lane is very different from the books. There's a lot of things that happen in there that didn't happen in the books, but ultimately it is still a story of friendship. And Netflix did that very, very well. Now going back and reading Fly Away, I can like picture all these characters and they are definitely fully realized for me. They feel real, but at the same time, I hate them all in this story because they are all so incredibly selfish. They are making such harmful, self-absorbed decisions and it just makes them very, very unlikable. I assume that by the end of the story, there is going to be some redemption for these characters. There is going to be a happier ending, definitely happier than what this book has been and definitely happier than the ending of Firefly Lane. I don't know. I haven't finished the story. I have about two and a half hours of listening time left, which like I said, I do plan to read today. And so I don't know how my thoughts and feelings are going to change by the end of the story. But all I know is that every single one of these characters is being extremely frustrating for me. I'm just like, okay, can we, can we get this over with? Can we get to the part where y'all realize what terrible human beings you're being and get your head out of your butts and start getting back to who you're supposed to be. You know what I mean? That's kind of my feelings right now. Those are my thoughts on that so far. Not necessarily all that cohesive or final, but that is what I'm reading. That is what I will be finishing today. And if I have any additional thoughts or feelings, I will be sure to let you all know in the vlogs that I'm doing for Slayer Fest. Aside from that, that is it y'all, finally. But I hope that switching to this format is okay to you. I will be sure to have timestamps down below of all of the books that I'm talking about. So if there are books that interest you more than others, you're welcome to just go ahead and click those timestamps and get to the reviews that you are interested in. Please comment down below and let me know if you have read any of the books that I read in the month of April and what your thoughts are. I would love to know. And of course, please let me know how Slayer Fest is going for you. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I post two videos a week, sometimes three, if I have my shit together and a third video to film. And I would sure love to see you in one of my next videos. Bye guys.